Uh, so next we have our keynote speaker. Uh, he's a professor emeritus of zoology uh, from Natural Resources Institute of Finland, Heikki Hentonen, and he will make his presentation via the net stream. Dear audience, uh, the organizers had a very uh, world-embracing title for me. So I, I a little bit modified it, and also the organizers asked me to have some emphasis on Echinococcus because it's very much on the surface in the in the berry mushroom business. People are worried. So most of my talk is about Echinococcus, and then at the end I will uh, have a few slides on uh, Tularemia, uh, mosquito borne diseases, and and uh, other rodent bone diseases. So what are echinococcus? There is a lot of confusion about that. Many people think they are viruses or bacteria, but they are tapeworms. But very tiny tapeworms around echinococcus is, is three to five millimeters. And the essential feature of the life cycle is that it goes through two mammalian hosts. The, the main host, the definite host, is always a carnivore. It can be a fox, dog. In Africa, it can be a lion, etc. And and the this carnivore predator is the host of the breeding, of reproducing worms in the intestine. So the eggs, which are the infective states, are produced in the carnivore and they are shed in the feces into the environment. Uh, the intermediate host is usually herbivore. It can be a uh, moose, deer in, in uh, Echinococcus canadensis system, or it can be a rodent, usually a vole or lemming uh, in uh, uh, Echinococcus multilocularis. And the main host is infected when it's feeding on the infected intermediate host. There has been a lot of confusion about the transmission. For example, in Finnish, Echinococcus multilocularis is Myra echinococci, which means wall echinococcus. And people are confused that walls in the forest are transmitting the parasites to humans. That cannot happen unless you eat the balls, which seldom happens. So the, the infective state is the egg from the carnivore, like from uh, fox, red fox, domestic pet dog. Okay, and these intermediate hosts like balls or moles, they are accidentally infected. There are a number of species of in the genus Echinococcus. This most feared, uh, sorry, the most feared one is, uh, is multilocularis. Uh, the main house are red fox, arctic fox, raccoon dog, which has invaded Finland uh, years ago and uh, now spreading in Sweden, and, and normal uh, pet dogs. And the intermediate host are small rodents, especially wolves and lemmings. I come to this later. And this is the third one because uh, it forms small uh, thread-like twists, metacestors in the liver, and in human, it, it, it's a little bit like a cancer. These other species, Echinococcus canadensis, the main hosts are wolves, dogs, and intermediate hosts are moose, reindeer, and so on. And uh, this, uh, intermediate forms in, in moose and reindeer, they are big, just clearly visible. And the same occurs in humans, and it's it's very different and much easier problem. Then we have in Europe, we have granulosus, big group of genotypes, usually go through dogs, and, and sheep is very common uh, intermediate host in, in Southern Europe. 
In multilocularis life cycle, uh, in the main host, the eggs start to emerge in feces about a month after the infection. But using these uh, modern methods, diagnosis can be done in a few days after the infection. The worms are small, but the, their abundance can be great. There can be 100,000 small worms in the intestine of red fox. And the, uh, the production of eggs in the intestine, in the feces, into the nature, is highest in the first two or three months, then it declines, but it can go on up to some six, seven months. And the essential feature is that this, this infection is self-limiting, so the, the worms get old and they die off. And even if the uh, intensity can be high, it, it's not causing any visible harm to the main host. But in the intimate host, in the wall, our murat, the metacastor's small twists are in liver, it is spreading like uh, budding, and the disease in humans is called alveolar echinococcosis. Uh, in contrast to cystic echinococcosis caused by uh, this moose, moose echinococcus canadensis and so on. And human is an accidental host and human is not a good host. If human gets um, infection and if immunity, immunity doesn't prevent it, it's very slow growth and the diagnosis is usually done after 10 or 15 years when the symptoms appear. And the we studies who have, who have analyzed this very much in detail, they have found that one per 10 infections lead to, to the spread of cysts in the, the tissues. In most cases, however, immunity destroys these infections and the estimate by the Swiss uh, scientist is that one per hundred ingestions, so the human has got the egg into the mouth and so on, only one per hundred leads eventually to the disease. So, in fact, it's very difficult for humans to get this disease. But the problem is that the incubation time is very long, as I said, and there is no transmission between humans. And in human liver, where it usually is, it, it's like a cancer, difficult to operate, and very often uh, after the first symptoms with ultra imaging, uh, it's misdiagnosed with cancer. No vaccination, but there are, there are drugs again, is it that if you are diagnosed with echinococcus, the drugs will prevent the further growth, but then but you have to probably enjoy the drugs for the rest of the life. This is a life cycle and I have marked in the right upper corner, this very vegetable thing, because this is the kind of life cycle image you can see quite often, but this is wrong. In many newspapers, usually this very vegetable business is included, but there is not really documentation that human can get infection through berries or vegetables. So in most cases, or almost always, people are infected from their own dogs. If the dog is uh, infected, eggs will uh, stay in the fur at the rear end around, around the anus and uh, that's the way the humans get the infection. So the risk from berries or mushrooms is, is very low. Uh, there are some reports in, uh, that in a very highly endemic region in Poland, uh, multilocularis eggs have been found in garden vegetables, but these results have been somewhat debated. But the authors say that this is a very high endemic small area. So the foxes are, city foxes are running in the gardens and that could be possible, but that's not very common. In fact, it's very rare. 
And there is also a Finnish exper experimental study uh, show that using uh, exothenia laticollis, it's a, it's a link parasite, but the eggs are similar to multilocularis. When the eggs were sprayed in water solution on vaccinium uh, plants, these eggs on the plants could be found later with PCR. So in theory, well, even in practice, it may be possible that uh, that eggs survive on the plants for some time, but uh, but uh, but really there are not reliable documented cases of, of echinococcosis through berries or mushrooms. But to show how it looks like in the left side, uh, you have a very nice infection of uh, multilocularis in the bowl. That's the way it looks like. And then on the right side, you have a liver badly damaged by multilocularis. That's a human liver. So there is still something left. And if uh, the spread of the infection is prevented by drugs, this human will survive. Uh, here you can see the intermediate stages of Cana Echinococcus canadensis, the, the moose species or curvid species. You can see how the, the tusks are quite big, visible. So if, for example, moose hunters can quite easily see the tusks if they occur in the in the moose. Of course, there can be a smaller one inside, but this is the way it often looks. Finding a multilocularis making diagnostics, uh, the old way was to look at the in intestines, but that's uh, not very reliable because uh, low infections are hard to see. You can count the eggs from the intestines, but that's not reliable because many other need eggs look similar. So this new methods, there is a copper antigen ELISA test, there are PCR tests, and these are also safe methods because uh, the intestines can be put in minus 70 for for a week, which kills the eggs. Seven, uh, four days in minus 70 is enough. So you can do the molecular diagnostics from frozen intestines. And also this is easy because there is no need to hunt foxes for the uh, echinococcus studies enough to collect feces. Multilocularis has spread in Europe during the last decades very efficiently. It started after the Second World War. First, the emphasis was here in Central Europe. Then uh, around 2000, uh, it had spread. And, and uh, in the uh, by the way, can you see the cursor? Or should I tell which photo I'm meaning? Can you hear me? Can you see the pointer? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so here is the present uh, uh, spread in Europe, actually on the British Isles and Finland and Norway mainland are free of Echinococcus. So over the last decade or two, it has spread over the Baltic states. Uh, it has spread to southern Sweden. And if you look at, look at here, in uh, 2011, it was found first here, and then there are several occasions in Sweden where it has been found, but not in northern Sweden, as far as I know. So why the increase? Probably first the work conditions had some background, but then rabies uh, bait vaccination was started to get rid of the rabies. And uh, because of foxes were not dying of rabies anymore, their populations increased very much. And uh, when the host, main host increases, the parasites do the same. And here is example from a part of Germany. Same in Switzerland. Uh, the low one shows the fox numbers, and with some time, like the human cases, started to increase. And here, from southern Sweden, 
It was first found in, in uh, winter uh, 2011 in Uddevalla near Göteborg. And then in a year, there were several uh, observations elsewhere in southern Sweden. And the, the figure right shows the place where the first red fox harboring Echinococcus was found in Sweden. We were trapping wolves there two months after, after that. So Finland is in happy position, also northern Sweden and, and Norway. We found Echinococcus multilocularis on Svalbard in, in uh, 99, and it really affected Norwegian thinking, but it, because they had uh, removed the guarantee for dogs from Svalbard to mainland. That was the current year was because of rabies. And year a year later, we found Echinococcus on Svalbard. So the guarantee was returned very, very quickly. There are several genotypes of both Mutilocularis and uh, uh, Canadensis. These E and N types are multilocularis genotypes. N is kind of American type of multilocularis. It has spread to also to Siberia. But then in, uh, in Europe, we have a European type and the Swedish multilocularis is typically Central European genotype or genotypes. Some ecological aspects. <clears throat> uh, fox hunting behavior is concentrated on patches where there's a lot of prey, which means high density patches of wolves. And th therefore also the fox cats spreading eggs of multilocularis, they also are created. They are not evenly in an environment. There are hotspots which are usually good microtus habitats, productive meadows, forest edge meadows. Also, there is a seasonality strongly because in the course of the winter, wolves are aging and they have time to get to be infected. So that's why prevalence in the wolves and in the foxes is highest in the spring. And uh, uh, foxes prefer high density microtus habitats. Usually the myodes, uh, bank, uh, bank wall, which means metsamira, skooks, or uh, those densities are lower. So there are clearly, um, clearly kind of interspecific or intergeneric differences between the walls, how good hosts they are for multilocularis. And in microtus walls, like Philwall, Peldomura, Kentamura, Arvalis, they are much better host for multilocularis than the bank walls. And especially these microtus auricula and lemmings are, are very good hosts. Bank walls, myodes can also be host, but they are not so good. The worm doesn't replicate as well in myodes. In Finland, there are no native endemic cases, neither in humans or in rodents or in, in predators. There was one human case in Finland, uh, 2014, but that person had, had been living in Germany for a long time, at least a decade, uh, probably much more. Uh, as he was diagnosed with multilocularis, but very probably it was, she was infected in, in Germany. On the other hand, uh, this moose, <coughs> Echinococcus is uh, canadensis, that's spreading in moose and wolves in Finland, uh, partly because the wolf distribution has expanded to west over the last decade. So uh, Canadensis is not rare at all in Finnish wolves and, and moose. But uh, this species was common in northern Lapland, uh, Norwegian side of Finnmark in old times before 60s, and that was because of reindeer dog cycle. But that 
it was eradicated when uh, people learned, learned not to give uh, reindeer uh, liver intestines to their dogs. In North Carolina, Finland, in uh, 15, I think it was, there was one human case. Young child who had a, a Canadian cyst in the lungs, and that probably came from families hunting dogs. In Sweden, um, as far as I know, since uh, the finding, first finding in 2011, uh, 12 human multilocularis cases has been diagnosed in southern Sweden. And most of them are imported, but, uh, but as far as I know, and discussing with the scientists, Swedish scientists and reading their papers, they cannot really uh, exclude some domestic cases. The occurrence of uh, multilocularis in Sweden is very patchy and low prevalence in foxes. And uh, Swedes have made very uh, intensive, extensive risk evaluations and uh, the risk has been considered so low or almost non-existent that there is no, there are no restrictions in berry picking and mushroom collecting. In Finland, uh, <clears throat> we monitor the situation carefully. We have our national wall monitoring uh, research in, uh, in Finland. Uh, we have made many long time series, some of them 50, 70 years. And multilocularis has never been found in walls in Finland. National Institute of Food and Hygiene, I think it's nowadays, uh, monitor red fox and raccoon dogs along the southeastern border because of rabies uh, vaccination programs, but at the same time, they check the multilocularis. The most important thing is deworming of hunting dogs, even old dogs, still better, but especially the hunting dogs, because they have the greatest risk to be infected. We report our non multilocular situation to EU annually, and that's why we have this extra border controls. Docs imported to Finland and need a certificate of recent parasite treatment. Well, climate is warming, and that will uh, increase the basic productivity, and that will uh, eventually be good and it will increase the abundance of, of general predators like red fox and raccoon dog, which are the main host of multilocularis. So there is no question that the multilocularis will not come. The question is when it appears. But why it's not yet here? Maybe our fox population are still so low compared to Central Europe, for example that the densities do not exceed the, the critical transmission threshold levels for the parasite spread. Another thing which may prevent the spread of multilocularis, even if it would appear sometimes, is that we have these very strong wall fluctuations, so the intermediate host. And we have these regular crash phases, which last sometimes two years. And if if there were a fox coming from somewhere with multilocularis, and if it happens in the wall crash phase, probably there would not be any stronghold because uh, there are no intermediate hosts at the moment. So that could help us. And when it comes from Sweden, it has been documented that it has come from Central Europe. The genotypes are from there. In southern Finland, it might come from southeast over the border. We don't know about the situation around St. Petersburg. I have tried to find it. I have discussed with Russian parastologists, and no one really knows if anyone is studying multilocularis situation around St. Petersburg or in north of that. But it's common already in Estonia, so 
it, it should be around St. Petersburg also. And, and concerning Lapland, maybe through via Kola Peninsula. Few other things, a couple, two or three slides. Uh, we have other zoonotic troubles in forests, uh, some mosquito bone diseases, tularemia, even if it's called uh, hair pest and so on, Yanis Ruto and Finis, it's, uh, it's carried, the reservoir is in rodents, in walls, and humans get the infection mostly through mosquitoes. So it's a mosquito borne disease in Northern Europe, while it's a tick borne or, or uh, directly transmitted in, in Central and Southern Europe. We have this Pocosta disease caused by Sinbis virus. In Swedish, I think it's called Okelbu disease. Symptoms of fever, rash, arthritis. These are both late summer diseases. So they occur at the same time when people are picking berries and collecting mushrooms. But uh, for example, for tularemia, there are strong uh, multi-annual variation. Sometimes only 10 or 20 cases per year. And in the best or, or worst years, there can be up to 1,000 human cases per year. And that depends on the world cycles. We have been modeling this. And if you look at this picture here, we have the world density year before. And then we have the climate of the present summer. So if you look at this way, you can see that the more walls there were a year before, which means it's a wall peak, indicating wall peak previous year, the more you have tularemia in humans. But what happens in the present summer depends on weather. If it's a rainy summer, it means it's a cold summer and the mosquito larvae are not hatching very well. If it's very dry summer, all the small bonds, bonds will uh, dry. So the same thing, not very many mosquitoes, but the normal average summer, like here, seems to the, be the best for, for uh, tularemia occurrence. So the wall peak year before is a necessary condition, but what happens in potential epidemic year depends on the weather. We have a nephropathy epidemica, so there is a typo, it's epidemica. Uh, caused by Pumala, hantavirus. Uh, bank ball is the, is the main host or the only host in the nature. And the voles are uh, spreading the virus in the urine and feces, even in saliva. And usually the humans get the infection uh, through inhalation in dusty places, no vectors. Survival of the virus outside in summer is, is two weeks longer in the winter. And this virus can be very common in the bank walls in winter and spring. But the human epidemic peak is usually late on early midwinter. So this disease doesn't coincide very much with the season when uh, berries and, and uh, mushrooms are collected. So this uh, nephropathy is more late winter late autumn, early winter disease. And uh, I have been asked very often, uh, is it safe to pick berries or mushrooms? And the risk is very, very low. And my usual answer is that, uh, that it is much more dangerous to drive to the forest and collect berries or mushrooms there. So some logic, basic logic should be maintained. Uh, the uh, incidence of human disease is, is very much affected by the wall cyclicity and also that we have these changes in cyclicity and that could affect the uh, abundance. And, and our modeling suggests that uh, in future climate change, wall fluctuations probably become more stable, but still there can be drastic peaks irregularly. Uh, I could have another two hours on ticks, but I have only 
one or two minutes. And this is concerning, I don't talk about the resinus, the normal sheep bean tick, how do you call it? But I mention uh, the invasion of Siberian tiger tick, the right figure here. This picture data is from uh, 17 by the Turku scientist. Now we have found it already in Helsinki area and it's spreading. And I have said that it's spreading like plague. The problem is that uh, these ticks are not identical. In fact, they are ecologically quite different. And one uh, special feature is that their seasonality is very different. This is from my, I have to be studying uh, sympatric uh, resinus and Persulcatus in Central Finland for five or six years. And this is typical uh, seasonal difference. Persulcatus, the Siberian tick, has very pronounced peak in spring. Then it, the adults disappear. And the resinus is, is more stable. Tick-borne encephalitis virus is much more common in Persulcatus. I have found places where it's 4% while in resinos it's it's 0.1 or, or less. So with the invasion of uh, Siberian tick, tick-borne encephalitis risk will really increase. But the positive side in that is that abundance of the of the seasonal abundance peaks in spring when the, there is no berry or mushroom picking or very little of that. So invasion of, of Siberia tick will really change the tick world. It's, it's changing it already in Finland. The seasonality of tick-borne encephalitis has been changing in those areas where Siberia tick occurs. And uh, also it seems to affect the Borrelia seasonal uh, epidemiology. And it's, it's as I saw here, the Sulcatus has already, already been found in northern Sweden, so you will get this eastern guest quite soon in larger areas in Sweden. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Heike. And now I'm itching and uh, scratching. And uh, but yeah, here's a question for you, Heike. Should I come over there? What well, I'll see. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah uh, so you were saying that the, this uh, echino uh, the real danger about echinococci is really marginal. Yet there are almost hysterical precautions. Uh, concerning the berry picking, for example, in Poland and, and in Austria and, and then also in, in Switzerland. So are these precautions in these uh, endemic regions actually in vain in terms of berry or mushroom picking? They are not useless, but there is a lot of hype. So it's very easy to understand that because this is a nasty disease, it takes decade to, to, to be diagnosed. So it's low, very slowly incubating in a human. But uh, even in, in Switzerland, where they have now, they have some between 50, 100 cases per year. Um, well, because it can be dangerous, humans are, are careful. I, I mean, I understand it very well, but there, there is hype. And also that this, this uh, kind of uh, truth, which is not the truth about the spread via, via berries and mushrooms, that, that certainly has been exaggerated. There are not really good documentation of that. So mostly, in most cases, humans get the infection from their own dogs. I had nothing against precautions. I understand them very well. And I'm just waiting when, when the multilocularis appears first time into Finland. I'm, I'm 
waiting for the hype in the newspapers. <laughs> it will be. It's the same thing when we found the multiple colors in Svalbard. There was quite a hype in the Norwegian newspapers. Stop, Are you stop, happy with this? Stop the sharing so we can see you again. Okay. So, Rainer, are you happy with the yeah, answer? I'm just thinking because eventually there will be a uh, multilocularis multi case in Finland also. So, uh, you said yeah, that you are kind of waiting, waiting, uh, and hopefully also you are prepared for the for the hype and, and hysteria, <laughs> which will which will uh, which is quite inevitable. So I hope that uh, that if somebody asks uh, when this first uh, uh, case will occur, I hope that uh, when somebody asks uh, uh, my opinion about that, I can tell uh, that please call to Heikki. <laughs> yeah, or anti Oxanen in all Oivira or Ruokavira scenarios. But uh, I will also refer to to the situation in Sweden when they found it in in uh, eleven. There was quite a hype in Swedish newspapers. I have a collection of them. And uh, two months after the first finding was done, I was trapping rodents in that area. Uh, but, and then they found some new places and the Swedes who may be more sensitive to, uh, to threats like this than Finns, Swedes made very, a uh, careful uh, risk evaluations and the final decision is that it, it's still so rare, low, low prevalence, local, that uh, there is no need to have any restrictions uh, for berry or mushroom collection. And in that respect, I, I would believe Swedes. So if we get the first observation, maybe one in Kotka and another, from Joens to, I think our risk evaluation would be very similar to that the Swedes made. But certainly there will be hype. Uh, we also have a question uh, in the chat, or do, do you want to continue on the uh, same? Uh, right. uh, about the same topic, but uh, different questions. So maybe, okay, maybe we we'll take yeah. the chat. Um, so it's it's written here that is it the imported dogs that at this time constitute the greatest risk for humans for Echinococcus in Finland? Yes, but that's why because Finland is Echinococcus free, we have a special uh, how do we call it exempt from EU that we ha the Finland has has these orders that all all dogs in coming from abroad to Finland must have a, a recent uh, treatment against multilocularis. So you, in theory or in practice, you should show the veterinary document at the border. I know that this is not 100% clear. For example, uh, in Torneo, Haparanda dogs are quite a lot transported over the border without any certif certificate checking, but in theory they should be checked. And I, I think they do it very much in, in, for example, in Helsinki and Turku, because in Estonia, multilocularis is, is common. So really, yes, so the dogs, dogs should be medicated before they are brought to Finland. Even if you, you take your dog to Central Europe for dog shows, and so on. When you come back, you must treat the dog before you return to Finland. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the live audience? Key, yes, please. Uh, we have uh, thousands of sledge dogs in Lapland, and I was curious if they can cause any risk for this zoonosis. They are. Uh, very high densities in certain areas, especially. 
and also from abroad. I know, yeah, but I I believe that the sled dog companies cannot afford the risk that their dogs would uh, transmit disease because that would be end of that company. And uh, so I, I trust that the dog owners, especially these commercial companies, they take care of their dogs. I mean, that they are medicated at least twice a year as well as hunting dogs are medicated. That, but then in that case, it's more question about Echinococcus canadensis. Thank you. Uh, and Rainer, one final question yes, before yeah, we move on. Actually, a question and, and about a little bit about the same topic to Kikorhonen, because there are a lot of sledge dogs which are using uh, uh, Metsahallitus uh, areas. And also, uh, Metsahallitus is giving hunting licenses for, for uh, uh, hunters coming from uh, uh, southern Finland. And, and uh, Heikki mentioned that the key to, to prevent this echinococci is, is deworming and, and uh, uh, free treatment. <coughs> Does Metsahallitus have, it, have any official re uh, recommendations about these uh, uh, precautions? <laughs> when you are giving, for example, uh, hunting licenses? I have no answer to that because I'm not dealing with any hunting issues in Metsahallitus. We should check from the eralua.com. Okay. <laughs> <No fee. laughs> Probably there I, is. I think that if I can, if I can say that uh, uh, the hunters are quite well aware of Echinococcus and, and the the hunter magazines are discussing the topic regularly. So my feeling is that uh, hunters medicate their dogs quite uh, well. So it, I, I don't consider that a big problem. There was a um, discussion sometimes, it was more than 10, maybe 15 years ago when, when uh, there were dog teams from Central Europe coming to Eastern Finland, Kusama and, and Eastern border in winter. And uh, I was contacted, contacted that is the risk, and that was before the Swedish findings, that is the risk that uh, these uh, German or other Austrian dogs would spread the Kinecococcus. And uh, I think there was one place where they were camping quite often and there was kind of a consideration of Central European dogs. So we did some wall trapping in that area just to keep the locals be, uh, feeling easy. That this, and we, of course, we didn't find anything. Thank you, Heikki. I, I agree with Key that, uh, that that question doesn't belong to the forestry. Park service, it, it's, it's a general uh, responsibility of the dog owners and, and hunters know this question quite well.